So we're, we're going through Psalm 1 today, and the reason we read Matthew, the Beatitudes, if you're familiar with the book, what those are, is it says, blessed are, blessed are. And Psalm 1, guess what it starts with? Blessed are. So like we're, we're, we're rolling here in a theme, but I wanted to ask you guys, um, has anybody like used that term and know fully what it meant? Or did anybody embarrassingly around the year of like 2009 put hashtag blessed at the end of everything without knowing I feel like I feel like such a lame person but as soon as I started studying this I thought of and I had to re-go watch it it's the uh, Jimmy Fallon Justin Timberlake hashtag thing for SNL like I immediately went back and watched it because I just read through this and I read you know blessed is the man and I was like it just immediately was like hashtag blessed like that's what that's what went through um, my head and they never said that in that skit I thought they did whatever that doesn't matter but right we use it so I want to ask I like I said I told in the beginning if you were down there you didn't hear me um, I, I work with students I work with teenagers a lot so there's a lot of this because if I don't talk to a teenager they're out in about five minutes they're somewhere else so I've got to interact with them so I'm going to treat you like teenagers for a little bit and I need y'all to respond um, hands did anybody ever say or like non-ironically say or use hashtag blessed I know I did I liked a lot of sunset pictures. I mean, it was <laughs> embarrassing, but sunsets are cool. I'll stand by it, okay? The sunsets in space are cool. They show how big and powerful God is, and I'll stand by that. But I was a loser with how I shared them. Okay, uh, you raise your hand, Anna. Do you have any context? Like, do you remember, like, oh, it was whenever I got a new this, or whenever I, like, do you have any, or anybody else who raised their hand? Anybody have a story? I didn't prepare you all for this. No? Got a new pair of shoes, and you're like, man, blessed. Like, I'm so blessed by the Lord today. Hashtag blessed. Um, you know, I forgot to pull it. Wait, let me, give me a second. Sarah and I, uh, like I said, we've been driving all over the state, um, and we were listening to a podcast. Um, and the, what do you call them, speakers? The host? Um, the host, actually, they, they talked about being blessed. Um, and I thought it was really good. I wanted to sh- I found a manuscript of this podcast. Uh, and it says, we too fresh, got to blame it on Jesus, hashtag blessed. They ain't ready for me. It wasn't a podcast. It was 24 Karat Magic by Bruno Mars. Um, came on the radio, but I heard that. And it was like, man, I was already done with this sermon, but I heard that. And I was like, yeah, like two, I don't know if that was 2009-ish. It was probably somewhere between that and like 2013. It was in my high school years. Um, dated myself there, but uh, it's fine. Um, so, but yeah, I, I feel like I've used that term a lot, Blessed. And it's fitting, I think, that we just sang a called, song called Jaira. Do you know what Jaira means? What that name means? Provider. Not blessed. Sorry, I set you up. I usually set people up on a T. Was that Lauren? Was that you? Yeah, I always set you up. It didn't work this time. <laughs> Provider. And when I think of hashtag blessed, I think a lot of times I'm like, and I'm like, oh, I was provided this new pair of shoes, or I was provided this job, or this new car, or whatever it be. Or I think, like, I hear a lot from families, like, oh, I'm just so blessed, hashtag blessed to have the family that I have. Like, I have these wonderful kids, hashtag blessed. Or, like, oh, I have these wonderful grandparents, like, hashtag blessed. And we think of it in this, like, God has provided good things, therefore, I must be getting rewarded. Like, I have been following God, therefore, he is blessing me with things. And that's not exactly what we're looking at today. Um, So I want, I... I, I'm gonna. I'm bringing the spirit of John with us, not of John Sharbach with us today. I'm gonna be a little bit of a nerd. Um, I've got uh, a Hebrew word uh, as a first slide. Can you throw that up there? Hopefully it's still there. Does it work? Oh, I didn't put a black background on it. Let me let me take some like hold this table up. Uh, are you gonna work that for me? Do you know how to do that? Because I don't. All right, we'll see how it works. So what works out for it? Um, this word, as it is pronounced, is ashrei. Yeah, it's fine. It, it's, it's fine. Everybody can see it. If you don't know in Hebrew, I'll stay in frame for them. Uh, you read backwards. So you read from right to left. Um, I took it in college. I'm not a master of it. Um, the letters, if you think in English terms, the letters are your consonants. The dots and lines underneath are vowels. Those weren't originally there when it was written, but whenever they were translating it later on, thank you, Charlie. That's fine. That's great. When they were translating it later on, they were like, man, people who aren't familiar with this language will have no idea. So the vowels that we think of weren't there. We, they just spoke it, and they just knew what they were. And we added dots and lines underneath the consonants 
later to explain it. So that one that looks like an X is, I say they were consonants. It doesn't, it's like a placeholder. It doesn't have a sound. Then there's a line underneath it that's the ah. Uh. The little like W is the sh. And then the uh, uh, two dots underneath it, that's also not a vowel. That's like a pause. That's like to pause the world. Ash, Ray. So there's, there's a little pause there with the two vertical dots. Um, conveniently, the backwards R is an R. That, that helps us out. Um, and then the two dots side by side, that's your uh, A sound. It's like an E. It's an I, but it's like, I don't know. I'm not good at English. That was my least favorite subject. It's like, like egg, like I'm having an egg. Ash, Ray. It's like that kind of an E. Um, <laughs> And then uh, the little curve is like, kind of like a Y, kind of like, an, like an anything. So anyway, that's the word, ashray, is how you would say it. Um, you can take it down now because I thought I would sound cool and I feel like I made myself look more like a fool the farther and farther I went on this word. Um, but this word is not the word for like a blessing of what we think of like uh, with one that we wrote a song, not we. We normal Christ, or uh, contemporary Christians, you know, Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you. It's not that sort of a blessing. So Psalm 1 is not saying blessing to the one. Instead, this word blessed, uh, blessed, I'm sorry, this word blessed is uh, also a word that is translated as happy. Specifically, if you use King James Version, it uses happy more often than the others do, but every version, there's a few verses throughout the Old Testament, which it's used in this exact, like, tense. Once again, I'm bad at English. I don't know if it's a verb or whatever. In this same tense, it's used 36 times. So the root word is used more, but this exact word in the tense is used 36 times. Um, and there are, there are some of those uses where all the translations use the word happy. Um, but the, the, the thought behind this word, blessed, is the man is not hashtag blessed by God is the man it is blessed the joy of the Lord is with the one who this and that same concept it goes into and I'm gonna get to this later it goes into that um, that Matthew 5 reading where Jesus read the Beatitudes the joy of the Lord is with the Mormon the joy of the Lord so so when we go today and when we read the psalm which we're gonna do here in a second I promise that's, um, that's, a, that's another accurate, like me not taking these out of context, but taking the word in its original meaning, one way that this could be read. Because I think blessed is just not a word that we use. And it's one of those like lost in translation kind of things um, uh, where it's just not in our normal like vernacular. Um, so once again, this is not a, um, this is not saying that you will be blessed or if things um, will change so that we can become blessed. Instead, this is a fact of the matter. The joy of the Lord is with a person. This is, this is a current state, not a because something has happened, God has given me. So I, I was a little lost in that. I figured we would uh, go over that for a bit. Um, and then lastly here, before we read it, um, of the 36 times this is used in the Old Testament, guess the two books where it is used the most. We're in one of them. Psalms, where Lauren, where are you? That was right there. That was set up for you. One of them, Psalms. What's another book that's kind of like the Psalms? Proverbs. Proverbs yeah, Psal Songs of Solomon would also work. But Psalms and Proverbs are where the majority of these thirty-six uses come from. So for them, when they heard "Blessed is," it was like us hearing "Roses are red, violets are blue." It was a statement to start off a poem, a song, where as soon as I said "Roses are red, violets are blue," interaction, someone give me a response finish that anything coffee's, coffee's great and i love you give me another one somebody sugar is sweet and so are you um i think uh, see i don't have i don't have a lot of my students in here there's only a few um i i would have expected if i had more of them uh you look like a monkey and you smell like one too uh, hopefully you don't get never mind i was i was gonna make a poor joke there anyway yeah so but it, it, really when i say roses are red violets are blue our ears perk up and go, this is a love poem. This is going to be a poem about two people who love each other, despite some maybe scenario or because you love something else, I love you even more. It sets us up to go, oh, this is a poem about love. And for their ears, when they heard, blessed is, at the start of a song or of a poem, they're like, oh, this is talking about the joy of the Lord being present with someone because of a reason. So let's read this psalm together with that in mind. 
Psalm 1, uh, just six short chapters, said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Jesus, once again, we just come to you because um, this song just says that the joy of the Lord, blessed is the one who loves your law and meditates on it. So I just pray that as we are here, we can love your, love your word here and that as we meditate on it, so that your joy fill us. Amen. Amen. Awesome. I talked about how we have a liturgy. Like every church kind of has their own usual way of things run. I do with most of my sermons too. I like to just look at the text and then talk about it afterwards. So we're going to do a lot of just like looking at this scripture and then I'll talk some in a little bit. I don't like throw a lot of things in the middle except for me explaining that I don't do it, which I realize goes against what I just said. So it starts out the first couple verses. It doesn't say the joy of the Lord is with someone who does. It says the joy of the Lord is with someone who does not. And I think that's really important. And I, I, I was a bit of a nerd. Once again, I'm going to continue. I'm, I have John Sharbrook, you're here with us. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> um, I really think it worked. Um, and the joy of the Lord, it says, is uh, who does not. And the first one is that is it walks in the counsel of the wicked. Now, this word walks, there's three verbs here. Uh, this word walks um, is, has almost any word. It has multiple meanings. My favorite when I studied Hebrew, I didn't put this in my notes. This is why I'm, I'm trying to go too long. Ruach is the breath, the spirit, or the wind of God. So when the spirit hovered over the waters, it was like the, the breath of God hovered over the waters. So man, if you're tough, you're down, you're in the dump, you need to pray for the spirit of God like a fresh breath in your life. I love that. Language is cool sometimes. That's my favorite one. Um, but this word walks, this verb, um, can also be translated uh, to wander or to follow. And to, so that you know that I'm not making this up, uh, like I say, not all translations are the same, so maybe yours will say walks. Go to 1 Kings. Um, it'll be on the screen, but go, I, I, I encourage you, if you have a scripture, go to it. It's going to be 1 Kings 14, verses 7 through 8. This doesn't coincide with Psalm 1. This isn't like a parallel scripture necessarily. It just uses a word, and I want us to see it. In 1 Kings chapter 14, Verses 7 and 8, uh, it says, Go, tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you a leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, and yet having not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart, doing only that which was right in my eyes. So this term walks with the wicked? Yes, walks in the counsel of the wicked. This isn't simply just saying like, oh yeah, they're friend group. Kind of, kind of bad people. Like, yeah, her friends, they're gossips. That's not what this means. This isn't saying like, oh, the joy of the Lord is not with someone who has friends that are wicked. No, the joy of the Lord is not with someone who follows in the ways of the wicked go back to that. I love, like, I mean, just how, what was it, 14, 7 and 8? Yeah, let me get back there. Um, when, when talking about uh, David, it says that David followed me with all of his heart. There is a David looking to God and not just being with him, but walking in step with following. Okay, God, you do this, therefore I do this. So whenever the psalmist is seen here, at the very, like the first line of the entire psalm book, like, I think that's so cool. All of the songs they sung, the first line is, blessed is the one who does not follow the wicked. After that, we have, uh, stands in the way of the sinners. If you go just a little bit farther over into 2 Kings chapter 15, 
we have another uh, usage of this word, stands. And in chapter 15, verse 20, it says, down here. Uh, man, I should have, I, I, I read through this and I was like, I need to get this name right. Anybody want to help me? Menahem? Does that look good enough for y'all? Menahem. Uh, exacted the money from Israel, that is, from all of the wealthy men, 50 shekels of silver from every man to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and did not stay there in the land. So throughout the entirety of, of the Old Testament, uh, through Hebrew, the translation of this word stand is also used for the word in our English dictionary to stay or to remain. So we think stand with, once again, and I, I, that's why I want to look, it's, this isn't like, a, oh, blessed is the one who does not have friends that are wicked. No, blessed is the one who does not follow the ways of their wicked friends. And blessed is the one who does not remain in the way of the sinner. And lastly, we have this last verb, and it says, uh, nor uh, sits in the seat of scoffers. Scoffers. In Genesis 13, 12, I don't know why that's in there. Genesis 13, 12, we go back and we have a use of this word to sit. And you're not going to hear the word sit. Um, I felt like I was talking to a dog the way I said it. You're, it it's not going to say sit in Genesis 13, 12. Instead, it says that Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among uh, the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. This is the exact same word, every letter, every dot underneath, every pause, exactly the same that we get here in Psalm 1 as we do when we talk about Abraham settling, making his home in. So this last verb that we get is not saying, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Man, I told, did you see who he had lunch with the other day? It's not that. No, it's, and does not make his home with the scoffers. Settle as the scornful. So to start this song, the very first song in the whole song book of the people of God that they had is blessed is the man who does not, to help us with translation, um, follow the ways of the wicked, remain like the sinners, or settles as scornful. I mean, I, last time I was up here preaching, I, I think it was when I was preaching, I don't know. I told you I was, I was having a hard time, and I love that Corey called me out. I was like, hey, you're kind of being a bitter person. I had begun settling as a scornful person. And I was grateful for him to call me out and be like, hey, I think this is something the Lord like needs to lead you to repentance on. And I was like, oh, man, you're right, because you know what? Like, looking back, comparing this to how I was then, I didn't have the joy of the Lord in my life. I was too focused on settling in and making my home with those who are scornful. And that's, that's how my heart had become. And, and that's how this song starts out is the joy of the Lord is with someone who is not uh, following wicked, remaining like sinners, and settling as a scornful person. And that really makes sense to me. When I read this at first, it's like, okay, hashtag blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. That one makes sense to me nor stands in the way of sinners. I would think standing in the way of them would be a good thing so the sinners can't get where they're trying to... No, okay. Um, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Like, yeah, maybe it's rude to take their seat when they're at dinner. Like, I just kind of get lost, but I think it really makes sense when we look at this and, and we kind of help understand what these same words mean can mean in our language. But like, no, the joy of the Lord is just someone who isn't, a, who isn't sinning, who isn't scornful, and um, is not following the ways of the wicked. So what does one uh, who is blessed do then? Like if it said like, or who is blessed? See, I, I keep messing it up. I can't even get this right, y'all. If, if, if like we're hashtag blessed, the joy of the Lord is with us. Um, I'm going to be honest with y'all. This annoys me because I know it's right. Verse two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Now, see, the law, when we talk about this, this isn't necessarily saying the uh, do's and don'ts, which I get this is kind of some do's and don'ts. This isn't saying the do's and don'ts of the Bible. The person who loves when God says, do this, 
that's someone who is joy in the Lord. But the law was their scripture. That's all they had. Think about it. When the Psalms were being written, they only had the first, they only had the Pentateuch, the law as it was called. So what this verse is saying is that, but the joy of the Lord uh, is in the one whose delight is in the word of the Lord. And on his word, he meditates day and night. And it says in verse three that through this, we are planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. See, we have some Texas, some non-Texans, but I think for most of the world, it's like this. Even when my wife and I went to Peru, we got to see, like, I don't know what they call it. It's like a real-life mirage. You're in the middle of this giant, like, sand dune for, like, 20 miles desert, and then you come over a hill, and there's a little lake and, like, a green, lush forest. And you're like, oh, that's why, like, the when you see it in, like, I don't know, Spongebob or something where they see a mirage and that it's not actually there. No, this one's actually there. It's a real city that's real packed around this tiny little body of water that's been there for hundreds of years, right? And in Texas, too, like, I, I have uh, some family hunting land in East Texas, and right through it runs this creek. In this creek, there's not much water. But you know what's on the banks of the creek? Trees. For the entire, well, actually, it's a bayou. I learned that that's cool. That sounds like, that makes me feel like I'm, like, from down in Louisiana or something, having a bayou. I'm a, I grew up on a bayou my whole life, and I didn't even know it. Um, but along this bayou are trees, densely packed. You will never find a stretch of this creek where, unless it was where my grandpa ripped trees out so that he could cross it, there aren't trees. Trees want to be by water. You know what's on either side of this creek on our land? No. Oh, sorry, past the trees. Past the trees. Sorry. <laughs> Lauren, you can, I'm sorry, you can be mad at me afterwards. After the trees, do you know what's there? Grass. Just a lot of it for a long ways. They have 50 acres. And on that 50 acres, there's a creek with trees on it and then grass. That's it. There's woods outside of their land, but there's a creek with trees right up on it and then grass. And Jesus says that the one who loves the word of God and who meditates on it, both day and night, is like that tree. See, this is also in East Texas. And in East Texas, there are two type of trees. You have, oh, deciduous and non-deciduous. <laughs> you have evergreen trees, ones that in the winter, they have like pine trees is what they are out there. They have little needles and they stay green. And then you have oaks and such that their leaves don't get pretty. They turn brown and they fall to the ground. And uh, you have different types of trees, but even the ones along the creek, yeah, during the winter, their leaves do wither and fall. It's not exactly like this. But the reason they can survive at all is because they've been planted by a water source. And that's what Jesus said it is like for the one who loves his word. And I, I, I want us to focus now one more time on those verbs and then the verb that is here for the one who does delight. In the law, it says that he is like a tree who is planted by streams. There's a good reason to be a little language or nerd every once in a while. And so that you know, you don't have to have studied it. There's a thing called interlinear Bibles, where you click on it, you like search interlinear, interlinear uh, uh, Psalm 1, forgot what we were in. And it pops up and it shows the Hebrew, and then it shows a little English word. And then when you click on the Hebrew word, it has a big drop down of the, the other things that can be translated as and every other scripture it's found in and you can just like you can be a language nerd without knowing anything or even knowing how to read it and then you click a button and it says it like it's really cool I love it um, but I think it's important to do that and see the benefit of this see the verbs that we talked about in verse 1 do not mention being held captive by the evil one it does not say, and the joy of the Lord is not with the one whom Satan has grasped been in his hands. The joy of the Lord is not with the one who has been dragged down by the serpent. It doesn't say that. It says the joy of the Lord is not with the one who follows, who dwells with, who remains with. Their choices of the individual. But when we look at this word here in verse 3, Whenever someone delights on the word, it's not that when we do that, we go and we dig a hole and we choose and we dwell next to a stream. No, it says that that person is planted by the stream. 
Y'all, this morning I told you I was beat, I was exhausted. All weekend long, confession, I didn't read my Bible while driving and traveling and doing, I didn't do it. And it was like in the middle of coming in this morning, other than like preparing the sermon, and maybe that makes me not fit to be up here. Hopefully it helps with honesty. Like, yeah, I read Psalm 1 and I read Matthew 5 and I read those two passages from Kings, but like I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything else. I felt exhausted. And then I come in, it's like, yeah, it's because, man, I haven't, I haven't chosen to be in his word. It's, I've been reading it all weekend long and it's really plain. Like when we, our delight is in the word of God and we meditate on a day and night, he plants us by that stream. And, uh, no, no, but slid down. Let me, like I said, b- bear with me. Um, right, it went down a lot. Okay, here we are. Um, nope. Anybody have some, what's some theme music for me while I, Right, okay. Um, So, uh, here we are. So whenever we, um, if if the one, right, if the one who uh, meditates on the word is planted, that means it is planted by another party. But once again, those other things, when we settle or we follow or we remain in the way of, those are decisions on our part. So what we do is if we are in God's word, but then we choose to do those other things, we uproot ourselves from where the Holy Spirit has planted us to keep us held steadfast in who God is, and we try to plant ourselves in infertile soil. And it just doesn't work. It's a, it's a decision made on a part that separates us from God. See, we try to dwell with untruth. Let me have another word for untruth. A lie. Right. I, 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 I'm glad y'all got that. I'll, I'll set that one up for y'all, and I wasn't failing on it. Yes. Uh, another word for an untruth is a lie, and there is a lot in our lives that is under the guise, is that word, like under the disguise, under the guise of being uh, loving or caring or this, that, or the other, that in reality is just an uprooted lie that we are following. And I think it's really fitting in this time for us, uh, and maybe that's why it it was laid on John's heart, and I'm grateful for where the Lord led him, to talk about this as we're going through um, our series on God, God's design for holy sexuality. See, this is the very first song. I don't think it's a problem for us only. Seems like when, they, when, when the Lord was giving them songs to sing, he was like, hey, delight in my word, don't uproot yourselves. There's a lot of other stuff out there. They're gonna say, hey, follow me, hey, dwell with me, but instead be in my word. And I think it fits for our, city, or, uh, for our setting as we're going kind of just wedged in the middle of this uh, series, because I think it's really easy for us to uproot ourselves and lose our joy in God and get wrapped up in the world's path for sexuality. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean like it's easy for us to see the worker on the corner. That's, that's not what I'm like, oh, it's easy for us to get wrapped up in some dramatic sense of, of, God, of the world's view of sexuality, um, that's not what I'm saying. I think it's easy to get wrapped up in our singleness as, as we're going. Our singleness, our dating, our marriage, our sexual relations, maybe our gender or sexual identities, preferences, or views thereof. I think it's genuinely very easy to get wrapped up in those things. I think um, it's really easy to take uh, friends or family members' experiences. Maybe that's some of us here in this room. Maybe it's easy to take books that we've read or podcasts we've heard or our or a friend's or family member's faith deconstruction. That's a very uh, popular uh, word right now. Um, and come out on the other end uprooted to where we've, maybe we've been planted by the Lord, but then we've come up on this other end. We've been removed and separated and we find ourselves following the ways of others. See, we don't see these things through the lens of truth, but as the truth. And I think that's where we get, we put ourselves in a very, not even slippery slope situation, because verse 6 of the psalm says um, that for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the path of the wicked will perish. Now, I say that not to say that these podcast books or experiences or deconstructions are bad things. I hope they're not, because Corey's been reading all sorts of books from different perspectives, right? 
Um, I even say, I, I love talking about this. It's my favorite heretic podcast. I love it. And that's how I always introduce it. And it's my second most listened to podcast. It's called The Bible for Normal People. Um, if you've ever heard it, or if you go and listen to it, go listen to it with me saying, it's my favorite heretic podcast. About 90% of the podcasts I listen to, I come out on the end, other end going, I think it's been uprooted. It's, it's a very Bible-driven podcast. They open every podcast by saying, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. And it's like a little joke that they throw on there. They're very joking people. But it's like, I went on the end, I feel like with a lot of things come up, it's like, okay, they have, instead of looking at things through the lens of truth, they kind of uprooted and they said, okay, here's, here's the truth and we're going to pull the Bible along with us to fall into there. Um, but that being said, the last one I read was just a textual criticism on was Mary Magdalene at the resurrection of Lazarus just because some of the early manuscripts doesn't have her and then the later ones do, but she's in every anyway it was it was just a long podcast about was she there or was she not because some earlier manuscripts don't have her some others do so it's just an understanding of translation and the people who are writing those manuscripts going oh that's right there was a mary and martha in this town and the other part of the book so maybe this was the same mary and martha anyway there wasn't like this wasn't they didn't pull any like biblical narrative I don't know what you call it. They just were looking at old manuscripts and talking about whether or not someone was there. And at the end, they were like, she very much well could have been. And we're not saying she was not. We just want y'all to look at the Bible and look at, as well as look at the original translations and stuff on it. Anyway, what I say, the reason I bring that podcast up is because it was shown to me by a friend who had just come out the end of his faith deconstruction path. Or de, de, deconstruct, that was it? Deconstruction? I thought I said destruction. Deconstruction path. And he was like, hey, I... I really want you to listen to this episode of this podcast. That I feel like this explains all of the things I feel and why I'm not a Christian anymore. And I would appreciate, because I've been having a hard time sharing it with you and like getting it out, I would love if you would give it a listen. And I did. And then we talked and he was like, I talked to five of my Christian friends and you're the only one who listened to it and came back. Like, thanks. And since then, like a year later, I was like, hey, did you hear the new Bible for normal people? He's like, I don't listen to that anymore. I was like, oh, well, I did. Let me tell you about it. And he was like, okay, cool. And we did. So there's this aspect of like these things, these books that maybe are from a viewpoint that uh, isn't biblical. It's not that they are bad things to uh, encounter. It's not like whenever you have a friend who has a life experience that is separate from the Bible. It's like, oh, I can't, I can't be a part of your life experience because this is truth and I have to be planted by the stream. That's not what Jesus wants for us. But whenever we are with the scoffer, when we're with the wicked, when we are with the sinners, that we are constantly rooted and planted in his truth. See, I still listen to that podcast, but my favorite one is Bible Books in 30 Minutes by a British dude. And it's great because they say funny words that I'm not used to. And also, that's one I highly recommend for anybody. If you don't know what a random book in the Bible is about, it's called Bible Books for 30 Minutes, and they talk about the history, this, that, and the other, and I come out on the other end, and I'm like, I feel like when I read it now, I can understand it better. It's really great. Check that one out. If you like that, if you like podcasts, Bible Books for 30 Minutes is a great one. Um, not a sponsor. Um, but if you want to fly me for a podcast over across the pond, that'd be sick. Well, I'll, you can sponsor us. That'll be fine. Um, and um, so what I do with these, right, is I don't come out on the other end saying this is truth. Instead, I go, wow, that's very interesting. I want to go to my truth and see what it has to say about this. And that's really important, not only for me to do with this, my favorite heretic podcast. It's very important for you to do this evening with me. You should not come with, like, away from me or Corey or whoever it is um, from a sermon and be like, man, that was so great. That truth was wonderful for me. You should say, man, that word was wonderful. I'm going to compare it to my truth. My truth being the scriptures of the Lord. Because, yes, that's what I'm coming from, and I know, I know that conviction in my heart, but you don't know that. You don't know the conviction in my heart. You should always check that. Not in some sort of way to, like, prove wrong, but because... Verse 2, your delight is in the word of the Lord. And on it you meditate day and night. So when you hear something that's about Bible or about faith or about life, you're like, man, I love the word of God. I can't wait to go see how that compares to my truth. Because the truth that is in Scripture is the ultimate good. I want to flip over. We spent a lot of time there, or we spent a good section of time there. We're not going to look at the Beatitudes for a long time. But because... Uh, Jesus said through the read through these taught these <laughs> words are hard because Jesus taught these I wanted us to look at them this morning in comparison to our 
uh, the joy of the Lord is with the one who, and see what Jesus says, that the joy of the Lord is with one. See, as we are encountering these um, other sources or with the scoffer or with the sinful, we must remember how, uh, how to present ourselves. And at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, starting in verse 3, Jesus says, and I'm going to change the word blessed to the joy of the Lord, just for translation's sake. The joy of the Lord is with the one who is poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The joy of the Lord is with those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The joy of the Lord is with the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The joy of the Lord is with those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The joy of the Lord is with the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And the joy of the Lord is with those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. The joy of the Lord is with the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The joy of the Lord is with those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the joy of the Lord is with you when others revile you or persecute you and utter all kinds of evil uh, against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Joy is found in those who approach those who might be on a different viewpoint. Either Christianity isn't real or Christianity is real, but I have a viewpoint of God's design for sexuality that's different from yours. The joy of the Lord is with those who, who encounter these scenarios, A, always with their truth being in Scripture, and B, with those who come with, uh, while they are poor in spirit, with mourning, meekness, hunger for righteousness, mercy, purity, and peace. Seeing asking questions to God for ourselves or for the others is not wrong, is not bad. Some, some examples um, of, of questions would be like, God, does your word say I have to have people address me as he or him if I don't feel like one? Or Jesus, uh, can I really trust all those pastors who told me that I can't be gay and Christian? Or, or God, marriage was different back then. Like they got married away by their parents when they were 16. I'm in my mid-20s, late 40s, early 60s. I think you understand why my sexuality is different. Can't I just be intimate in the stage of life that I am in? See, going before the Lord with questions, with understanding, with saying, hey, this is a path I don't know I'm lost, that's not a bad thing. I just, what Psalm 1, the very first song that was in their songbook that, that the Lord wanted the people to have to sing to him is blessed is the one who does not follow the ways of the wicked, but loves my word. So as we're going through this series, if any of you are ones who are like, ooh, I think they said something that sounds like it's over here. Whether that's saying maybe it's, maybe you are here and we're over here or we are here and you're there, I don't know. Either way, if you hear something that's like, whoa, that sounds outside of truth, please, please come talk to us. We're not gonna be mad. We're not like non-confrontational people. We're like, oh, how dare, how dare you say, I don't know everything about the Bible and how all these words are supposed to be translated. And uh, like, no, absolutely not. Well, we never be like, whoa, hold on, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. No, that's, that's how we were right. Please, please, we ask, like, if the joy of the Lord is found in you being in his word and we say something that sounds separate from that, come talk to us, that would be great. Because I know I, in my early life, said things that as I grew up, I was like, wow, that's not what God meant at all. And I really wish someone, whenever I was 17 and speaking in a youth group when our youth pastor wasn't there and I had no idea what I was doing, would have been like, hey, you got that one wrong, Stephen. So I could, the next week could be like, hey, guys, we're going to rewind that back real quick. This is what God's word says. So please, if you hear that, like, just come talk to us. And that's with it, really with anything, not just with the series. Like, if y'all are like, hey, I feel like we're really missing the mark on our uh, global missions, come talk to us. Or like, hey, I think Austin Life would really succeed and follow God's mission if they love the Lord and did this, because this is what his scripture says. Please talk to us, because we are family, we are body. Whether this is your first week here, or this is your 50th week here, like we are, we're in it together. So know that this is a place to always come with your questions, to come with your doubts, to come with your, hey, maybe we were, because what we want to do with you then is go to God's word and seek that. And we're open to correction, and we 
uh, because we might need it, and we pray that uh, you might be as well. Um, and then I will, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up here in just a second. Three last things, one of them, is, or two of them are very quick. Um, Corey stood right here with a symbol a few weeks ago, and he bashed it. Y'all remember that? He did? Okay, if you were here, right? And what, what he read from was 1 Corinthians 13, 1, which I'm going to flip over to. Um, if you, like I said, I was at a wedding this weekend. Everybody knows it. It's the, it's the wedding, it's the wedding uh, scripture. You can't possibly officiate a wedding without reading 1 Corinthians 13. It's like a sin or something. And it says, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And that is the word of the Lord, and that is true. If you, you can have all of the wisdom, you can have all the things, but if you do without love, it's just a bunch of clanging and clashing, right? But what happens if you have all of the love, but you don't share the wisdom? What do you hear? Silence. And I, I feel like, especially in the U.S., it's everything, everybody's polarized. Everybody is far opposite ends, and we feel like we either have to be loud and screaming or we have to be silent. But what I want us to do, is, especially as we talk about through this series and through uh, the first psalm that we have, is, is talk about this marriage of both volume and silence, of truth and of love. And I want us to look at it specifically in um, the story. Um, and we're not going to pull up. We're not going to read it. And here in a minute, I'm going to have you maybe set an alarm to do that. And that's my thing number three. Um, but for now, thing number one, in John chapter 8, the story of the adulterous woman. Whenever Jesus came to them, they were like, ah, let's get him. Let's get him here. Hey, the word says, the, the law says this woman should be stoned. She should be killed. She should die for her sins. And Jesus, as someone who loves the law of God and meditated on it day and night, knew that. He didn't go, oh, well, no, you're wrong. God's actually changed. See, God's viewpoint now is they sh she shouldn't die. God's different than he was. Jesus said, yeah. So first perfect person, the one who's worthy of killing her for what she's done wrong, go for it. See, Jesus knew the law. He loved it. He did not go, oh, I hate, I hate that God said to kill people. That's just so not nice of him. He should have more grace on her. He should understand. That's not what he did. He was like, yeah, for the sins that she has committed, this woman deserves to die. But God is also a perfect connector of love. And he goes, okay, you guys, have at it. Whoever hasn't sinned, kill her. They were like, oh, well, that is, wow, I, I forgot about the word of the Lord applying to me. I thought it just applied to others. It was a really good point. And it, one by one, they left. And Jesus was standing there as the perfect person, right? The one who had the right to kill this woman because she deserved to die. That is the word of God for her sins and for mine and your sins, we deserve to die. And in this perfect combination of the law, the word of God, and with his love and truth, he goes, go on and do what? Sin no more. Jesus is pushed this one. was like, hey, like God's word has changed. Everything's good. Like, go at it, gal. That's not what he did. He said, I love the, the law of the Lord. You deserve to die, but I love you. Go on and be different. Go on and change. You go love the, the law, the word of God. Meditate on it. Go on and sin no more. So today, um, maybe you are someone who has, like, as, as I'm talking, maybe you're talking as you're seeing my confessions of in the past have done it. You're like, man, I have uprooted myself. And instead of interacting different aspects of life through the lens of truth, I take those things as my truth. And you're asking, can I be replanted? Yes, and this is why I said it's really annoying and why I don't like it because it sounds too simple. You want to know how you do it? You read your Bible. You, you love, and not just read it. You meditate. You think. You reflect on the Word of God. And when we do that, we don't plant ourselves by water. It's not an action on our part to be returned from our action of leaving. Instead, when we love the Word of the Lord, it says that we are planted in the streams. So that whenever things are good, man, we're growing fruit. When things are bad, that's okay. We're still like those pine trees. We're still going to hold our green. We're going to make it through because the Lord has planted us and planted there. So it's, it's y'all, it's annoying because in my life, I, and, and our, we have a staff text with staff and wives. Literally, we were talking 
uh, just this morning, yesterday, feeling like we've been doing a lot of things and 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 we 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 feel like a one way street or like we're just feeling some sort of disconnect. And the reality is, I know for myself, and saying that is like, well, duh, you've uprooted yourself. You're just you're not in His Word. Love it, and He will plant you. So maybe that today, if you're like, man, I've just or maybe I, I don't even feel like I'm necessarily following ways of the wicked. I'm just not reading it. Just be in his word and he will plant you. That's, that's the truth of the very first song that God gave his people to sing. Love the law and I will provide for you. Now my last thing, and then I'm done. They can come up. And if we're going to sing in worship, um, we're going to have a little bit of a work to do together. Because, like I said, I work with students. How long is their attention span? Short. Did I lose some of y'all's today? Is that possible? Adults, it's still not great. Mine's not great. I would have lost me. Um, Jared's like, yeah. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> um, if you have a cellular device to get it out, I want us to work on something together. Go to your alarm app, whatever you use to set alarms. And if there is, if you already have, like, hey, every day I wake up at 5 a.m. and I read the Bible, or every day when I put the kids to bed, or every day whenever I am at lunch, the great. I'm not asking you to do something on top of that. I want you to join in what we're all doing together. I'm getting my phone out too. Set an alarm for tomorrow for a time where either you always do or maybe you're like, man, I don't really read the Bible. Well, I'm not very good at that too, so I'm gonna join you and I'm gonna help you out. Set an alarm for some time tomorrow. This counts for y'all too. I know you've got a guitar, Charlie, but set an alarm. You've, you've got a second. It'll be fine. Um, and name the alarm a scripture. Maybe you want to make it, what did I say that was? Was that John? John 8? Was that the, right? Story of the woman? Yes. Maybe make it John 8. Maybe, I, I'm setting mine for Psalm 2. I read Psalm one day. Why not read Psalm 2 tomorrow? I don't know what you want to do. Maybe you are in the middle of reading through, I don't know, Job. Put that Job scripture in there. But set an alarm for tomorrow for a time where you at least can best assume that you will be free. And uh, title it. Read, like I'm just doing my label, read Psalm 2 at 2 p.m. Why 2 p.m.? Because Lib is in the middle of a nap and because it's Psalm 2 at 2. That I can only go so far with this, with this tactic before I run it. I guess technically if it's military time, then it would be Psalm 2 at 14, but it's fine. I won't worry about it. Read Psalm 2, save. That's actually going to go off when we get done with teardown, but I'll snooze it and I'll make it go off again tomorrow. Um, yeah, I, I just, church, I hope that at some point tomorrow, everybody in this room, your alarm's gonna go off and you're gonna read scripture and Austin Life can take part in going, man, you know what Psalm says, those who delight in the Lord have his joy or delight in the word of the Lord has his joy. I'm gonna start doing it. That's my advice to you. And if you get stuck and you haven't read your Bible for a long time, that's okay. Just set another alarm. Jesus just wants to be with you. It really is as simple as that, and it bothers me that it is, but it is. The joy of the Lord is not with those who follow the wicked, but it's with those who follow his word.